Hello, everyone. This is Steve Marinucci, writer for Billboard.com and Access.com, welcoming you to another Things We Said Today, where we talk about the Beatles, past, present, and to come every week. Before we get started, let me introduce my three co-hosts on the East Coast, uh, first starting up in Maine, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, uh, formerly, well, so, still sometimes with the New York Times. He has written for many publications. He's also the author of Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. The one and only Mr. Alan Cozen. Hello, Alan. Hey, Steve. Hey, Steve. And hello, everyone. Um, next in Connecticut, where I assume it's snowing because it's raining here. It's, it, it's, it's gotta be snowing where you, where you guys, I assume it's snowing where you guys are. Is it? It snowed so. a couple no? of days ago. A couple oh, okay. of days ago it did. Not right now. Okay. It's been, yeah, it's been raining here in sunny California. Um, anyway, um, in Connecticut, the host of the Beatles show, every little thing, Mr. Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. Hey, Steve. Hi, everybody. And last but not least, the executive double underline editor of Beale Fan Magazine, and also a um, if you go to the Fest for Beetle Fans, you're very likely to see him there too. Uh, the author of Changing Times: 101 Days That Shaped a Generation, Mr. Al Sussman. Hello, Al. Hi, Steve. Uh, hello there, everybody. And it was uh, we had a little bit of snow this morning. But it warmed up. It's about it's close to fifty degrees now in Pittsburgh. Oh man, it's been raining here a lot. Um, they had a we had a nasty storm over the weekend. It didn't really come down real hard where I am, but today it was raining pretty badly. So, in any event, um, enough about the weather. Uh, that's not what you're here to hear about. We've got a subject in hand that we're going to talk about for a minute, but we thought we'd run across uh, a couple of newsy items um, that have happened uh, recently. Um, I published a, a story on access.com ye- yesterday, which is which was Monday, um, the uh, 9th, about the Weeklings' upcoming gigs at the Cutting Room. They're doing a string of gigs. Um, I believe it's a five total. Uh, five or six, no, six, excuse me. It's six total. Uh, through January and February, including a string of a bunch of Thursday nights. The first one will be um, the 19th, but they're also playing, uh, I believe it's the 11th, uh, for a special tribute to um, Clarence Clements. Um, Ken, do you have anything to say? Are you going to go to that, Ken? Because I know you're... No, that's- actually, that's when I have my show on the air live. So Are you going to, to you going, you're going to go to at least one of those shows, right? Well, I'm going to – they're doing a show at Daryl's house on, oh, okay. uh, on January the 21st. In fact, I'm giving away tickets on my website for that show. But I am going to try and see one of the shows at the Cutting Room in addition to that, but I haven't decided yet. But definitely the show at Daryl's house. I, You know, I, I obviously I have not seen them live, and I put a, uh, a video of Drive My Car – of them doing Drive My Car in the story I, I wrote yesterday. And I was just astounded how, I mean, we've all heard the, all th- all four of us have heard the CD. Um, we've all pretty much, we've all marveled at it. But the live sound is great. God, they sound so good live. I mean, I was mm-hmm. quite surprised sure. that they sound just as good live uh, as the records. I mean, it's, they, they really do sound good. So if you're in the area, um, but where's Dar- where, where's Daryl's house, uh, Ken? It's in Pauling, New York. And, okay. and as a matter of fact, uh, speaking of Daryl's house, there are clips that are on YouTube of them performing at a show they did at Daryl's house. And mm-hmm. they like that venue so much. They love the acoustics there. They are thinking about, it's not definite, they are thinking about recording a live show there. Oh, really? Release. So it's a great place to see a show. Yeah, the drive my car video I used was recorded there, and I was quite. I was it, it really nice. They did a, a really nice job. But yeah, uh, so that's interesting. The other thing we were going to mention really quickly is the the phenomenal success of the Black Beatles song on hmm. on the Billboard charts, and that I mean I I, I think that it really has just a cursory connection to the Beatles, even though it just has the Beatles name in it. We were sitting here talking about chart songs that that uh, 
had the that mentioned the Beatles, which we may talk about at some point in the future. But I mean, it's just it. Uh, you know, I, I, I to be honest, I have not really paid that much attention to the song. I mean, it's it. it there's really nothing to to pay attention to because it's really not a it has nothing to <laughs> yeah. do. It's not it's I mean, not a Beatles cover. Right. It's, I mean, there is a, there is a mention of John Lennon in in the song, but it's oh, okay. it's obviously you know musically it's just it's about as far removed from you know Beatles music as you could probably get. It's you know it's basically it's contemporary hip hop, maybe the little EDM thrown in there. Right. Uh, you know, it's basically music for teenagers. It's a but you know it, it's the same thing. That uh, was a move like Jagger. It's the same. It's the same. You know, it's the same attraction. I mean, move like Jagger was a big hit too, and that really didn't have. That didn't have any connection with the Rolling Stones. Mm-hmm. You know, so I mean, it's the same. I mean, we're gonna we're gonna get more of these type of things where people mention names like this, and you know, I mean, you well, could you could go ahead. There's all there's also uh, a reference to Paul. In the song too, and yeah, yeah, it's true. There's really this song has nothing whatsoever really to do with the Beatles. It's kind of using the Beatles' name, but um, the fact of the matter is, it's it's been a number one song. It just finally uh, dropped from number one, but it's been number one for several weeks. It was a huge hit. I wouldn't just say it's a song for teenagers because there are a lot of people who take hip hop and rap seriously to go beyond just the teens. Mm. So for people who do like that kind of music. Obviously, they must like this song because it's been number one on Billboard. It was number one for quite a while. I just saw uh, on Wikipedia, they are saying it was number one for seven weeks. And mm-hmm. not only that, but it worldwide, it's been a huge hit. It's made the top ten in Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the UK. So it's not just here in the States. And it, um, uh, it, I think a part of the reason why it caught on was because it became kind of like the theme of this mannequin challenge, and mm-hmm. to the point that even that even Paul McCartney, you know, did a did a tweet in which he, you know, showed himself, you know, being part of the mannequin challenge mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. basically endorsing the song. I think Ringo did a mannequin challenge too, actually. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah so. with his band on stage. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then, and then on top of that, you know, talking about you know Beatles popping up out of nowhere, you have Don, um, Donald Glover mentioning the the be- comparing the Beatles to the group Migos at the Golden Globes, which got tweet, which got a a lot of tweets. I saw a lot of mentions on Twitter uh, the day after the Golden Globes. So, that, it's, but we we were going to mention the other songs that have Beatles in the title that charted. Well, I well we, there, there's I just a couple. There's a couple that I know of. Mm-hmm. Okay. There's "We Love You Beatles" by the Carefrees, mm-hmm. which made the top forty, and there was "Pop Hates the Beatles" from Alan Sherman, oh, right. which uh, I'm not quite sure how far that charted, but I know it didn't make the top forty. And but this is this is the biggest hit song. That there has ever been to have the name Beatles with an A in the title. So there you go. Gee, bigger than a love letter to the Beatles by the Four Preps. Believe it or not, a top that. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> bigger even than that. Bigger. <laughs> ah well. Anyway, um, I'm 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 running through. Let me see. Uh, Pop hates the Beatles was did not make the charts. Didn't make the charts at all. Didn't make the charts at all. I'm looking at. I have my singles book in front of me, and and it did not. That's kind of shocking, considering how hot Alan Sherman was. Yeah, because it was only the year after Hello Mother, Hello Father. Yeah, mm-hmm. and considering how big the Beatles were and Alan Sherman at the same yeah. time. Mm-hmm. Wow, that that's actually shocking. Yeah. Yeah. But wasn't uh, yeah. Alan Sherman's audience mainly an album audience? I mean, you bought Pretty comedy much, albums, yeah. you didn't really buy comedy singles, you know what I mean? Although, Hello Meta, Hello Fada was a hit single. In, mm. That was, that was, huge. I mean, in that was summer, huge. Summer of that was huge, 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 huge. I remember, well, I remember going to camp and hearing that. <laughs> they sure. played it when I was at camp. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it was, it was huge back in the day. But in any event. Okay. 
to the business at hand, we're doing a little survey among us as to the three best Beatles singles. And these are not our favorite singles, but what we each feel are the best Beatles singles. So we're going to we're going to go one at a time. And uh, I will start with Alan. Alan, what do you think? Oh, OK. Um, well, from the early period, I would have to say I want to hold your hand having written a book. <laughs> God, that's something. How the, how the Beatles, I want to hold your hand, changed everything. Um, partly, you know, because I mean, I, I'm not sure what criteria we were using to determine what was the best single, but not necessarily our favorite. I mean, it, it almost seems, it stands to reason that if it's our favorite, we're going to think it's also the best. But so if we're talking about um, criteria other than that, um, like, you know, historical importance, I mean, I want to hold your hand really did change everything. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it basically helped open up the U.S. to them. Um, their earlier singles had come out on a small label or two small labels uh, and done nothing. And I want to hold your hand even before Capital released it. I mean, it's an incredible story where you have Capital actually trying to get DJs to stop playing it because they're not ready to distribute it, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> But um, and, and and you can read all the details in God, something how the Beatles did. <laughs> yes. um, yeah, that makes three three plugs. Now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Available as an ebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I now, just so, make sure, so did, mm -hmm. did the Beatles release a song called "Change in Times"? I just want to make sure. <laughs> no, unfortunately. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, hmm. Um, they didn't release one called Meet a Monkey either. I don't think. <laughs> so the next question, of course, was which I want to hold your hand single are we talking about? And, yeah. um, and I tussled over this because, you know, part of me likes to go for the sort of, you know, authentic um, uh, composer authorized release, which would be I want to hold your hand on the A side and this boy on the B side. Those are the, the two songs that the Beatles and George Martin picked to be the single and released as a single. And mm -hmm. on the other hand, we have the one that we all grew up with, which was I want to hold your hand on the A side. And I saw her standing there on the B side. Uh, the arguments against I saw her standing there would be that the thing is like a year older almost than uh -huh. than I want to hold your hand. It was from a different album, from a different bunch of sessions. The Beatles really sort of in a different place. And yet, it's actually, you know, in some ways a better song than This Boy. I mean, This Boy is, is great. I love the harmonies and everything, but the chord progression is lifted from, you know, there's lots of 50s rock songs with that kind of chord progression and vocal harmony. I saw her standing there is, you know, one of the earliest completely original sounding Beatles songs. Um, I mean, there was Please Please Me, of course. And the reason I didn't choose that single was because I'm not crazy about Ask Me Why. Um, so I, I felt that if it's going to be the best single, it should have like two sides that are really strong. And I want to hold your hand. And I saw her standing there it just is a great combination. And of course, we also all grew up with Meet the Beatles. And those are the first two songs. So uh, followed by this boy. So I'm going with the American one on this one. Not to mention that it came with a picture sleeve, which you can now get with the cigarette airbrushed out of his hand. <laughs> <laughs> So it even has a certain amount of, uh, you know, lore attached to it. Um, okay, my second one uh, was Paperback Writer in Rain. Oh. Um, so we're skipping all the way to 1966. A lot of great singles in between. I, I think we can, I think we can stipulate that we all agree that basically the whole run of Beatles singles are great singles. But Paperback Writer in Rain came in a way as a, a kind of surprise, you know. It it they're both really hard rocking songs. Um paper they're 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 also unusual songs, you know, they're not really they're not love songs or, you know, any of the things that pop songs normally deal with. I mean, one is about wanting to wanting to be a novelist, basically, and the other is, you know, one of John's kind of laconic comments about 
you know, sitting back and staring at it all happening, you know, when the rain comes, he doesn't mind. And it has the backwards tape at the end and, uh, you know, paperback writer was sped up as well. I mean, they're both pieces that had a lot of electronic fiddling done to them. You, you hear it less on paperback writer, but, you know, they're, they're both really a step ahead. And I think just a, a great single for that reason, apart from just being two great songs. And my third one, which in terms of ranking would really be my first one, is Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields. Penny Lane, you know, is, is the sort of, you know, classic, attractive Paul McCartney song with all kinds of nice touches like the, the Baroque trumpet. And, you know, when you hear, as, as, as we've, we've been able to hear some of the outtakes and the and the under construction takes um, over the years. I mean, it's you kind of listen to the early takes of that when it's just you know the pianos with the sort of echoey sound, and it is mm. so far from the finished conception that you know it's you kind of wonder you know did Paul have the finished conception in mind and kind of work towards it through those takes that sound nothing like it or. Or, or how did this thing come together? I mean, it's just a masterpiece of um, electronic layering and and great ideas. And then there's Strawberry Fields, which we've talked about at length in the past. An incredible song from John and an absolutely incredible production with, you know, the, the two takes um, joined together in a way that, you know, just sounds natural and magical. Um, and those two songs... You know, in a way, even more than Paperback Writer and Rain, which has a similar have a similar relationship. I mean, one is clearly Paul, and with all of Paul's strengths, and one is clearly John with all of John's strengths. And so you have on this little piece of seven-inch vinyl in each of those cases, you know, a record that basically is a summation of the Lennon McCartney part of the Beatles magic you know i mean and and you get ringo and george of course in the great performances but they're they're not there as writers so those are my three okay you okay dating them <laughs> no I, 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 I would not be surprised if uh at least one or more of your picks gets picked by someone else but we shall we shall see uh ken uh, how about you hmm well, this proved to be a little bit more difficult than I thought it was going to be because it's easy for me to mention my top two Beatles singles, but it's not that easy for me to mention my third because I look at so many Beatles singles as all being great, all being wonderful, all being fairly equal, and so many reasons to admire each one of them. But um, And also the fact that I don't always associate Beatles songs as whether they were the A-side or the B-side of singles. In England, it was so much different because so many of those singles were separate from the albums. But a song like Yes It Is, which really, I don't know what it is about that particular song. I love it so much more now than I ever have. I don't necessarily think of it as a B-side or the B-side to Ticket to Ride as much as it was an album cut here. So, but anyway, um, and also you have to factor in whether there's some emotional connection that you might have to certain songs and also have to weigh in the historical part too. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I don't know if you should, but um, I'd have to probably say, if you're going to mention emotion and historical, I have to say, I want to hold your hand. And I saw her standing there because I want to hold your hand was the first song I ever heard by the Beatles. And to this day, it's still so exciting and so electrifying to hear that. And I Saw Her Standing There is one of the greatest rock songs ever. And just to hear the introduction, the one, two, three, four, going right into the song. Those two songs back to back, plus it also started my love affair with capital singles and the capital swirls and oh, collecting, shit. you know, it was the start of all that, although that has nothing to do with these two songs specifically. But, you know, one of my fondest memories of growing up as a kid in the 60s was collecting 45s. And sometimes it was so exciting to, to collect anything that was on the Capitol Swirl, even mm -hmm. if it wasn't a Beatles single, you know, mm -hmm. Beach Boys, Peter and Gordon, whatever. But um, I Want to Hold Your Hand still takes me back to where it all started for me and for millions of people 
in America. And uh, yeah, so I, I probably would say that if you're attaching emotion and, and history as well. If I wasn't going to attach <laughs> emotion <laughs> and history, I probably would pick We Can Work It Out and Day Tripper mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. We Can Work It Out is such a great song that as far as a Lennon-McCartney song is a great example of the two of them working together when it's not an early, early Beatles song. And so I appreciate the song on that level because Paul and John brought so much to that song and what they wrote. And, you know, it's like so many Beatles songs, two minutes and 10 seconds, it says so much and you just want to hear it over and over again. Mm -hmm. And Day Tripper is also one of the greatest rock songs and it has one of the most iconic guitar riffs ever to start a song. Mm -hmm. And um, when you've got a great rock song and then you've got an iconic riff to go along with it. What could be better than that? Mm. I mean, between Day Tripper and I Feel Fine, <laughs> you know, they're, they're both so great as far as how to start a song with a guitar riff. And, um, you know, everything about Day Tripper is just wonderful. I could say this about so many Beatles songs, but I'm randomly picking a third one. But on the basis of both songs double a side in this case i'd probably go with that one number two has to be penny lane and strawberry fields penny lane to me is probably the ultimate perfect pop song from paul on every level great melody great arrangement every single instrument in that song it was just arranged so perfect and like alan was saying once you add the the piccolo trumpet and all the different elements that go along with it and uh it's just you know it's a perfect pop song. It doesn't get any better as a pop song than Penny Lane. And Strawberry Fields, for all of its innovation and invention and all the different sounds that you had out of it and, you know, the miracle of how they put the whole thing together, it really is, as Alan said, you know, Paul at his best, John at his best for those two songs back to back. It's kind of ironic that those two wrote songs that had to do with you know, a part of Liverpool, a part of their childhood on the same single. And I thought that gave it an added touch as well. And number one for me has to be Hey Jude and Revolution. I don't think you get any better as a song than Hey Jude um, because of the fact that the melody is so great. Paul's vocals were never better. I love the coda or the refrain that lasts for two to three minutes. And despite the fact that it goes on that long, It never gets boring because Paul does a lot of ad-libbing during those last few minutes. So they're not just repeating the same thing over and over and over again. It is one of the greatest melodies ever. Doesn't really matter whether it's a simple melody or not. But I love the buildup of the song leading up to the big scream. And uh, it's just a magical moment there. Well, (laughs) there's so many magical moments in the Beatles. But to me... Uh, Hey Jude will always be, you know, the greatest single they ever made. And the fact that they had one of their greatest rockers on the B-side. And as soon as you hear that opening guitar part, it just jolts you. You know, it's one of the greatest rockers, not just by the Beatles, between this and Helter Skelter and I'm Down. Those are like the greatest rockers to me in the Beatles catalog. And, uh, you know, it's another case of Paul giving you one of his best and John giving you one of his best. So I think you don't get much better. Plus, it was the start of Apple Records, the first Beatles single on Apple Records, part of the first four. So it has that history, too, if you want to attach that. So those would be my three. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Al? Okay. Uh, Actually, my list is is actually rather similar to Ken's, as a matter of fact. But uh, let me see if I can make a few different, uh, different points. Uh, my number three is, in fact, Penny Lane's Strawberry Fields Forever. Now, this was this was the record that that really kind of uh, rendered the uh, you know the four the four jolly mop tops obsolete. That this was the end of that uh, of that period, absolutely. And it was the first it was the first Beatles single since the previous August, which you know later on it didn't really wasn't really a big deal but it was the first time that we had gone that long 
without a, without any kind of Beatles release. And, and in the midst of all of that, in the fall of 60, uh, uh, 66, there had been all of these rumors that the group was breaking up. So the wait for this record was absolutely torturous. Yeah. <laughs> but it was, it, was worth, it was worth the wait. Uh, uh, Penny Lane is, uh, you know, you, you, you could say that it's a, you know, a more traditional McCartney song, but... As both Alan and Ken pointed out, there are all these little, uh, these little, uh, these musical subtleties in there, which uh, which were you know much more sophisticated than previous, uh, certainly previous Beatles singles. Strawberry Fields Forever is uh, again is is a. In fact, I, I remember um, uh, Steve, you had mentioned that hearing. Since you were living in New York at the time, you had heard Dan Ingram actually putting down. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had, he went kind of uh, very hot and cold on it. Um, at uh, you know, at one point he called it uh, not a record but an experience uh, because it was it was so entirely different mm-hmm. from anything anything they had released up to that point. And it is such a, you know, when you hear the original John's original demo for it, it is really a beautiful song. And, and then to, to really accomplish his ultimate vision for it with the, uh, the job that George Martin did in kind of knitting all of the elements together, including those two disparate, uh, uh, vocal tracks. It's uh, it, for 1967. It's a uh, it's it's quite an accomplishment, and it's a uh, it's it's a it's a great great record. And it was the it was the uh, the the perfect appetizer for Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, which of course made the wait for that album all the more torturous because. Uh, the the Penny Lane Strawberry Field single came out in February, and it was June. It was the beginning of June before Sgt. Pepper. And I can tell you firsthand, the wait for that was even more torturous than than it had been for uh, 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 for Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields. Uh, second is uh, again, uh, I want to hold your hand. And uh, and uh, as with Alan and, and Ken, I picked the the American single with uh, uh, with I saw her standing there on, on the B side. I want to hold your hand was absolutely the perfect vehicle to break the Beatles in America. And, and for one thing, because it was so completely different from anything that was that was on the on the radio or on the charts in in the US at that at that point in time it was completely out of left field and i mean it, you know people look at it now as oh gee doesn't that sound quaint but i think people don't realize especially people that are younger uh, don't realize just how revolutionary that song was uh, and how and how its impact was, and you can find out by reading. Got that something? <laughs> Your check is in the mail. <laughs> can I ask and you something about that, Al? Can I ask please? You? I remember when when Alan's book came out. I asked him this same question: If she loves you had been the single at the time, mm-hmm. or please please me. Don't you think either one of those songs could have done the same thing? Don't you think that they were different compared to everything else that was coming out in America at that time? Well, they, She Loves You was released, and so you know, the previous fall. And, uh, uh, I, you know, I remember Murray the K playing it on his record review board on, mm. on WINS, and it got... Mm you know, men's amends, you know, just kind of mediocre response. And um, months earlier, Dick Clark had played uh, Please Please Me on the record review board on uh, American Bandstand, and it got much the same kind of just kind of men's amends, you know, nothing, you know, no no great impact at all. It just seemed that, that for that moment in time, I Want to Hold Your Hand was absolutely 
perfect. Well, I know that the early Beatles singles didn't do well. They failed the chart here. But right. could it also be that those record labels didn't have the money to spend in promotion? Except that the record, except that I Want to Hold Your Hand, began taking off before Capitol had a chance to put their promotional campaign into, uh, um, you know, into place because it, uh, you know, there's the story, of course, of, you know, Marsha Albert um, mm-hmm. seeing the Alexander Kendrick report on uh, the CBS Evening News, writing to her favorite DJ, Carol uh, Carol James, WWDC in Washington. He then getting a copy of I Want to Hold Your Hand, having her come on the air to introduce the song, and like something out of a bad Hollywood script, the phones went crazy. And then he, in turn, made copies of, of I Want to Hold Your Hand for other DJ friends in other parts of the country, and in the middle of December, the record started taking off like it was like a prairie fire. And, and then by, of course, the first week in January, it reached, uh, it reached New York. And that's when it really, that's when it really took off. But Capital was left totally flat-footed. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, they and, even and like I said, they were, they yeah. were sending out cease and desist order. <laughs> yeah. Of all things. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> so. Yeah, exactly. But it did help to get the, the TV exposure there. Right, right. Which I believe probably was them playing She Loves You. I think. Uh, right, yeah. the, right, the one in Burnmouth. Was, mm-hmm. that, was, that was She Loves You, yeah. Right, right, because I Want to Hold Your Hand hadn't even been released in England yet <laughs> at that point. Mm. And I, I think also that um, I saw her standing there being released as the B-side was was a perfect move as well because yes it was you know it was about a year old uh and in fact could it could already be uh purchased on the introducing the beatles album that had just come out but it's you know it's it's probably it's probably maybe the first example or maybe the only example of just what a a, a total consummate rock band the Beatles were in their in their formative years. You can kind of hear the sound of of the you know the the Beatles from their club their club years in you know especially in the instrumentation on on I saw her standing there. You know it's just a cl- you know a classic rock and roll song. And I think you know the, the combination of the two was a, was just a perfect a perfect one two punch. So that would be my uh, my second one, and the third one uh, or number one actually um, is the same uh, again the same as uh, as Ken Hey Jude and Revolution, um, which was the you know I mean the, the fact is it was the biggest selling and uh, uh, Beatles single had the the longest chart run at number one of any of any Beatles single. But uh, but it's also just it's I mean, it's a song that I've heard. Oh, my God. I, I couldn't tell you how many hundreds and hundreds of times in nearly, you know, nearly 49 years. And yet it's a record that I've never gotten tired of. Hmm. And and of course, you know, even though, yes, earlier that summer, Richard Harris did have did have that you know, a hit with uh, MacArthur Park, uh, the fact that this was a Beatles record and that it was over seven minutes long really did break down barriers. You know, it made possible something like American Pie four years later. Mm-hmm. You know, absolutely. Hey, Al, uh, can, I, can I ask a question? Please. How many times have you sung that at the end of the uh, Fest for Beatles fans? <laughs> I don't, a, a, a lot. <laughs> okay. A lot I just, for the years. I just, I just yeah. curious. Because actually, I don't, um, I don't actually remember when, when that tradition of, um, uh, of started of Liverpool doing Hey Jude and the staff all coming on stage started. It was probably sometime in the eighties. 
I'll have to. I'll I'll ask, ask. Yeah. Next time. I would, I would guess it. I would guess it was was earlier than that because I thought I heard that Mark loves that song. Mark oh, he does. does. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Adores it's, that song. So. Oh yeah. Oh, no question about it. Uh, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll have to ask him. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. Yeah, I'd love, we should have we should have asked him last time. We had him. Maybe if we get him on again, we can we can do that. But yeah. Anyway, did you? Did, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, That's okay. Man. Did you have more to say? Do you have more to say? Uh, yes, um, because there is another side. <laughs> Aha, okay. And because that, that record came out, uh, and you know, uh, Ken was talking before about uh, historical and emotional impact. And the single of Hey Jude and Revolution came out the week of the Democratic Convention in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's... You know, it's, it's I've, been going back and forth with people who have been who have been whining about about how terrible a year 2016 was. That it was the worst year in the history of the world. Well, I got to tell you, I lived through 1968, and um, 2016 was nothing compared to 1968. Oh, I remember. I remember. 14,500 Americans died for no good reason in 1968 in a war that had, you know, had neither been officially sanctioned or declared. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, an, uh, an, apostle of, uh, an apostle of nonviolence and a presidential candidate were both assassinated within two months of each other. Mm-hmm. So uh, and and a, and a lot more. Uh, so it was so <laughs> by the time of the Democratic Convention in Chicago and what happened there, revolution really kind of set it all for uh, for a lot of us who, you know, who really, you know, we, we definitely wanted change and we wanted, yes, revolution. But how to go about it? Do you do it with violence or? Or nonviolence, you know, that's the the conundrum that uh, that Lenin felt, and uh, as you know, as he expressed in the the other version in you know the uh, Revolution One uh, on the White Album, but uh, it was um, it, it was absolutely perfect. It was the the timing was could not have been more perfect, and also Revolution uh, should only be heard in mono. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely, should only be heard in mono. Uh, John okay. was right when that uh, the Dennis Elson's interview when he talked about them uh, making uh, revolution into uh, into stereo and turning it into ice cream. Now mm-hmm. it really takes it really I takes agree. yeah it really takes the guts of the single out. But okay. it's uh, yeah it's just a wonderful uh, it's just a wonderful wonderful record. So those are my three. Okay, thank you. Now it's my turn, and I swear to God, to let uh, let us let us all swear with each swear to our listeners that we did not consult each other before we pick these lists. Because, and you will see why. Um, <laughs> right now, my uh, my three singles, and there's no order of uh, of preference here. I mean, I just uh, these are the three singles. Uh, I, as far as my criteria for best goes, was that. Both sides had to be excellent. I mean, there were songs that I would have loved. There were singles that I would have loved to have picked um, that I did not because the the other side of the single didn't measure up. So for that, like, for example, Yellow Submarine and, and Eleanor Rigby. I mean, I love Eleanor Rigby, but I don't think Yellow Submarine is as good mm-hmm. a song, you know, as Eleanor Rigby is. And the same goes with... Um, with Day Tripper, I mean, that's another reason I didn't pick that. So here's my first one: is Are you ready? I want to mm-hmm. hold your hand, and I saw her standing there. And the reason to do the, for that is because it was so historically important as far as the Beatles were concerned, as far as society goes, which you can read all about in 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 <laughs> Al Sussman's. <laughs> <laughs> But seriously, no, seriously, uh, and and and, but um, yeah, I mean, it was such a, a monumental uh, single in terms of its impact on society at the time. There's no, and I, you know, I mean, I still can remember things, you know, to this day of, 
you know, um, um, watching, for example, watching television uh, in Boston and Arthur Fiedler coming on and, and, and talking about the Beatles and, sure. and which, he did, yeah. which he did on the Shea Stadium show, uh, mm-hmm. the Shea Stadium special. Um, I mean, I can, there's all sorts of things, um, uh, you know, that happened back then, uh, I mean the the merchandising. I I, I don't know, uh, uh, Al. You probably remember the merchandising in the store with the displays and all that, mm-hmm. with all the yeah, sure. stuff. It was it wasn't. I mean, it, uh, one one direction, and the, the groups today don't kind of even come close to what was happening back mm-hmm. in '64. Not even close. So that's single number one. I mean, I, and and I love the I love the songs. I want to hold your hand. Has always had this kind of bright joyfully joyful bounce to it Mm -hmm. that you know still 50 years later you can't get away from i saw her standing there is an excellent rock and roll song even though it it borrows from their influences but uh you know she was just 17 if you know what i mean it reminds me of the uh some of the uh uh, the naughty pre-code movies that i that i i've become a big fan of for those of you that are movie fans of pre-code movies and that's kind of the old kind of the old uh teasing teasing kind of lyric there you know you know what i mean and um that i think that that was a brilliant touch by by john and paul so that's number one for me number two is paperback writer and rain (laughs) okay okay and the reason the reason there is because the the brilliance of the two songs uh paperback writer showed the development of the beatles uh of paul paul and john as songwriters and how they were they were just ready to they were just kind of on the precipice of really uh, get it. they'd moved away from you know the fab four and they and they were on the the edge of you know what we knew or what we saw later but they were still kind of in the middle and paperback writer was a, was a very well developed rock and roll song with some great harmonies. Rain was, was um, I guess you could call it psychedelic light because it wasn't really, you know, it wasn't as uh, psychedelic as they would get, but it was just beginning to, to be there. And it was just enough that it was this kind of, and it, you know, it was just kind of, Hey, what is this? What are they doing? So that, you know, that's uh, interesting. It, and it so happens that today, this morning, while I was doing my workout, I was listening to um, the Beach Boys Pet Sounds um, mm-hmm. 50th anniversary, which, by the way, if you guys don't have that, um, I recommend it highly. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of that stuff's been released in the past because the Beach Boys haven't been shy about putting, about, putting out um, <laughs> outtakes and stuff. But there's more there than in the stuff that they've put out in the past. And listening to some of those outtakes from that album, and uh, which come from the same period as Paperback Writer uh, and Rain, are just tremendous. And you, you really mm-hmm. wish that the Beatles would do more of that, would do it. And who knows? Maybe they will. Um, we will see. But um, anyway, number three is Strawberry Feels Forever and Penny Lane. <laughs> Yes, I and I swear we did not we did not consult Alan and we were talking, <laughs> but uh, again because of uh, and it's really more about Strawberry Fields and getting into what I was just saying about Pet Sounds, the development of that we've been lucky enough on the bootlegs to hear a lot of the development of Strawberry Fields. It'd be really really great and maybe they will do that this year, um, is for the Beatles to put out uh, a real look at the development at how pet sounds developed in the studio i think that would be that pet would be awesome. well uh, well i mean because it's all they're all from that period you know it'd be nice to have that and and pepper a big you know a big uh, how, how it was done but strawberry feels like i said the development of strawberry feels in the studio is just amazing and it goes kind of along with what uh, you know the same kind of uh, musical symphony that Brian Wilson did with Pet Sounds is is what was happening there with the Beatles with Strawberry Fields, and it'd be great to for everybody to be able to hear that. But the song the songs themselves, I mean, the fact that they you know they paid tribute to Liverpool, 
they um, and then uh, what Alan said about Penny Lane being, you know, being Paul the uh, quintessential Paul song, and, and Strawberry Fields being the quintessential John song. I, I mean, they're just amazing, and the sound effects in, in Strawberry Fields still to this day just blow me away, you know. But uh, I mean, I, I I really wanted to. I swear, I really wanted to. Uh, my initial feeling was to put in Hey Jude. Uh, my initial thought was to do Day Tripper. My uh, I even considered something, and Get Back. Get Back was one that I really kind of wanted to do, but uh, when it all came down to it, it had to be those three. It had to be. So there we go. Hmm. You know, one one thing that you said I would kind of disagree with is that uh, Rain Rain you called psychedelic light. I don't know if I call it light. I think it was the beginning of you know the psychedelic. Mm-hmm music for for the Beatles as well as I'm only sleeping which was the same time by having the the backwards voice vocals on on rain and all but I think the sound of rain once you you boost up the bass from Paul and you have that exciting drumming that you never I mean <laughs> from mm. from Ringo to to be all over the place with his drums I don't know if I would call that light but you know it's not as layered you know right. as say strawberry fields forever you know, and I am the walrus and those songs, but uh, I don't know if I'd call it light, but that's just me. You know, it is pretty okay. heavily layered. It, it's just that mm-hmm. it's layered mostly with electric guitars and their own instruments rather than the unusual, more unusual sounds in Strawberry Fields. I mean, listen to Rain closely. Also, the fact that they played with the speeds, you know, I mean, they added the vocals at a, with with a backing track that was not played at the speed it was recorded. And that, that changes a lot mm. about the atmosphere. And it also, it also makes those layers of electric guitar sound, you know, like almost like a bagpipe at times. I mean, it's just a very weird, mm. weird sound that, um, I, when, at the time it came out, it really was captivating. I mean, I think, I think a lot of us might've first heard it. I'm not sure how, far in advance the single came out before the ed sullivan show but um i know that the sullivan show was you know might have been for me the first time i heard both of those songs and Mm -hmm. it was like you know you're tuning in to see what it's going to be and like wow you know that's what i think about that you know it's what are they doing it's great you know Mm -hmm. but um yeah but, but yeah i wouldn't call it psychedelic light either it's it's um it, it is the beginning of psychedelia, and it's uh, mm-hmm. they were doing stuff that other people weren't doing. You know, who were their who were their peers who were coming up with sounds like Rain at the time? I don't think eight miles was, high. Yeah, it's yeah, but eight miles high. Mm, it's long and it's jammy, mm-hmm. but it's mm-hmm. not it's not that kind of strange murky layers of electric guitars like rain was you know which mm-hmm. was, it's true yeah do you guys remember when they did rain on ed sullivan that when they paused at the end the audience clapped because they thought the song was over yeah <laughs> that's right yeah. <laughs> that was uh that was that was funny well, um, and also you know we didn't really know much about it at the time or yeah uh, or even you know probably notice it but we've noticed it subsequently on the you know the bootlegs and 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 i guess i i think they included in the one video but you know paul is holding up the transparencies for the yeah. butcher cover <laughs> right mm-hmm. for for a second you know and for you, you know you could put it on pause which we couldn't do back in those days actually i don't think i knew that until you know that it was the you know, the butcher covered transparencies until, you know, Bruce brought it up last year. Mm-hmm. And also, just... and also, you know, all the girls noticed that Pulse had a broken was, tooth. Right. right. Yeah, yeah, that was right. I remember at the time that was a big subject of, mm-hmm. you know, it was like, you know, who cares? <laughs> We are getting up to the end of the hour, um, so I, and I have one more news thing to bring up. Go ahead, Ken. I just wanted to ask Al a question because he was talking mm. about uh, Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane kind of signaling the end of the mop top era. Yeah. Um, didn't songs like Eleanor Rigby kind of 
start that too? I mean, it wasn't happy go lucky Beatles there. A, li- a little know? bit, and you could. I mean, you could even. You know, I was just thinking about the uh, uh, the paperback writer and rain videos, and that certainly with the with the sunglasses and mm-hmm. and all. Uh, that was certainly not for Jolly Mop Tops either, right. but uh, you know th- there was you know the the fact that they they still were touring and there was still the kind of the illusion out there that there was still the you know the you know the Beatles that the the girls had all known and loved. Um, so even though there were there were changes afoot, we really didn't know too much about those changes but certainly by the time of penny lane and strawberry fields especially when the uh when the promo clips debuted and Mm. and and even before that when when people saw the uh the picture cover and for the first time saw the mustaches and and that little bit and that beard that george had grown in india uh, you know, that was, uh, you know, that was definitely not the, you know, the cuddly four jolly mop tops because in those days it was like, you know, it was, it was weird to see mustaches on men in their twenties. Mm-hmm. But I think when we first yeah. saw the cover, I'm not sure we were absolutely sure that they weren't like, like the picture wasn't posed as an old timey costumed picture. It was really when we saw the yeah, videos. That's true. We realized the video, they're, yeah. they're, they're walking around like this, you know. Yeah. Oh yeah. The, the videos were absolutely, you know, I'm sure, you know, everybody of course has seen the uh, you know, the the, the American bandstand clip mm-hmm. of uh, Dick Clark after showing the two uh, the two promos, uh asking the very straight laced kids in the, uh, in the, the, in the gallery there, what they thought. And it was like, they look like old men, you know, and, uh, you know, it definitely the, you know, it was, it was not, it, 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 the, the look wasn't well received at that mm-hmm. point. Mm-hmm. Of course, a year later, probably most of those same kids are probably, you know, also sprouting mustaches, and and mod clothes and things like that. So, yeah. right. you know, change change sometimes works slowly. Mm-hmm. A- anyway, um, I have one more news thing I wanted to bring up. Um, I did a uh, uh, a little unscientific poll on Twitter last week. I don't know if you guys even saw it. And I asked, what would you like to see the Beatles release in 2017? And the way and Twitter Twitter has a poll function where you can conduct polls and I figured uh, what the hell I'll give it a shot and I put up four choices I put up a Shea Stadium let it be a 50 year Sgt Pepper package and the Beatles music on Blu-ray and uh, you probably can guess which one and it won by a lot was let it be sure. uh, with 60 percent of the vote. But second was Shea, sec, second was Shea Stadium, third was the 50, 50th anniversary Sgt. Pepper, and fourth was the Beatles on on uh, Blu-ray. Hmm. So, and I mean, I didn't. I, I'm not calling this scientific at all because only 194 people voted, so that's not a lot. Still, it's not. Still, yeah, but uh, a decent representation. The de- yeah, yeah, somewhat. So I wouldn't, you know, I mean, I wouldn't base a. Uh, you know, a whole lot of I put it wouldn't put a whole lot of weight on that. But the fact is that, you know, anytime we've talked about it, anytime it's been brought up on Facebook, you know, let it be is what comes, you know, what everybody wants to see. So the question is whether or not, you know, I mean, I, you know that they they know. Uh, and the question is whether they'll finally give into it, um, you know, put aside whatever you know, problems or, you know, whatever reasons that they have for holding it up. But, uh, you know, will they finally do it? Who knows? I really do believe it will be coming out within a year or two. That's just my own personal gut. Well, I, I, I kind of do too, pretty much because of the, but more for the uh, 50th anniversary. I don't think they'll let it get past the 50th without doing something because they know that, bootleggers will will have a field day and so i i don't think they'll let it get past that but well, uh, if if they if they let 
if, say, they let the Sgt. Pepper 50th anniversary get by without doing anything, then that'll really be the sign that they really don't care about anniversaries, and so all bets would be off. I I kind of don't think they will. I think I think Pepper has enough. Uh, you know, they have enough. Res- I wouldn't want to say respect, but they have enough. You know, they're well aware. Awareness, I guess, is what I'm trying to say of you know, what Pepper means and what it has meant to them, mm. um, that they'll, they'll do something. I think, I think that's, I mean, I, I, I don't have anything to base that on, but I, I do think that something will happen. I mean, it's, it, you know, we've just started the year. It's a long year. Um, and God only knows what they're going to do, but, um, I would think we'll see something. I mean, they surprised us. Uh, how, I, uh, you know, how many of us were? And I admit, I, to a some extent, I was surprised they did the the one DVD because we've been asking for it for so long. You know, it se- everything seems like it falls on deaf, deaf ears, but they were listening. And so, and and Hollywood Bowl last year. So they are usually, sh- and, whenever and they even put though, out anything, it's always the end of the year too. Right, they've had a tradition of waiting until the end of the year for big things. I mean, that's been the way they've always done it. Um, and, and even with one plus and the Hollywood bowl, people still weren't satisfied. So, well, uh, you know, uh, it, uh, and, and we've gotten into this before as sure. to who they're, who they're aiming at, you know, they're aiming at a general audience because they know the general audience you know, will buy is the ones that they really want to, and because they want to score big. You know, so I mean, that's uh, they, they basically leaned that way for a lot of the stuff they've done. Even even the Cirque du Soleil show is more at a general audience, really. Than uh, although it it has there are some fan elements in there. You know, especially if you listen to it, listen to it, catch the show in the beginning, as as Alan and I did, uh, with all the outtakes that they played, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I it seems it would seem that something will, you know, I, I'm I would think something will happen. Um, we want to announce the winners of the uh, of the uh, Blu-ray uh, uh, deluxe version of uh, Eight Days a Week, and they are uh, Brian Blackwell and. Paul Quintana and you gentlemen will be hearing for us, from us soon. So thank you for entering everyone. And uh, we will have an, actually we are going, we are going to, I'm going to announce another contest right now. We are giving away three more copies of eight days a week, but this isn't the deluxe Blu-ray. It's just the single disc Blu-ray and all the people who did not win this contest are entered automatically if you want to enter, please send us your name and address to things we said today radio show at gmail.com, which is where you can write us with love letters and hate letters, and uh, which we have gotten. If we have gotten a few comments this week, for which we thank you. And uh, you can contact me at beatlesexaminer at gmail.com. I'm on Facebook, and I also have a Beatles news group called Beatles News and Commentary, which you can join and talk about anything you like, including the show. And the show also has its own Facebook page, Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Show. Alan, where can they get a hold of you? Um, basically, the easiest thing to do is at um, Alan Cozen on Facebook or Alan Cozen Remixed on Facebook. Okay. Um, Mr. Sussman? Uh, similar to Alan, uh, Facebook, Al Sussman, Twitter, uh, A-S, uh, at ASUSS49, and or through Beetle Fan Magazine, www.beetlefan.com. And Ken? You can email me at everylittlething at att.net, and my website is kenmichaelsradio.com. I just want to mention a couple of quick things. I am giving away two pairs of tickets to see the Weaklings in concert. And in addition to playing at the Cutting Room in New York City for five dates or six dates, as we just announced, they're also going to be at Daryl's house, which is in Pauling, New York, on January the 21st. I'll be at that show. This is Daryl Hall's place. 
Um, and if you want to win, just go to the brand new page on my website, Ticket Giveaways. And I also want to mention that um, in Connecticut, in Bridgeport, Connecticut, there is a public radio station, WPKN, and I've been asked to uh, make a guest appearance there next Tuesday on the radio between 7 and 9 a.m. And we're going to be talking, I believe, about the eight days a week film because they're going to be showing it in Bridgeport at the Bijou Theater on um, the 19th. The Bijou okay. Theater in Bridgeport. Okay? And wow. that's it. Okay. Um, thank you, Ken. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Al. And thank you, everyone out there listening, for uh, being with us again. This is Steve Marinucci uh, for Things We Said Today. And we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.